I've brought you a gift. What is it? In today's film, we're going to lift up our crystal balls and think about what kind of movies and TV shows audiences will want to watch after the pandemic. It'll show you your dreams. What's going to sell? What's going to get made? Let's get stuck in. If you ever buy a financial investment, there's normally some small print which says past performance is no indication of future performance. I think with COVID, films and TV, we can ignore that. And we can actually go back to the last time America, the home of Hollywood, experiences a massive amount of national trauma. After the horror of 9-11, audiences flocked to comedies like Zoolander. They wanted to laugh, they wanted to escape from the horror that they'd been subjected to by 24-hour news. We're all glued to the news, just like this time. I do think that movies that help us escape, to love, to celebrate laughter, comedies, romantic comedies, I think studios will definitely want to put their money in there because they're so worried that we can't take reality. And I remember a studio executive said, two days after 9-11, we will never make a movie with a character who is in physical jeopardy again, which is crazy because of course they did. Now that's what I call a knee-jerk reaction. And other knee-jerk reactions, there was a Reddit forum where somebody was trying to put a petition together that the name of Peter Jackson's second Lord of the Rings movie, The Two Towers, should be changed because it was too close to the Twin Towers and it was disrespectful to have a movie called The Two Towers. Remember that phrase, knee-jerk, because I've seen evidence of knee-jerk reaction already to the idea of making stories which are related to COVID, the pandemic. There's a script competition. And one of the judges, a producer said, we don't want any COVID stories. COVID stories will be binned. And people were commenting on the Facebook saying, yeah, nobody wants to watch your lockdown story. And they're right, up to a point. I'd say it's very unlikely that we want to see a drama about a family in lockdown, given that we've all been living this now. There will be a time when we might want to come back and revisit this time. But I think the big thing is that we haven't yet seen the true story of what is really happening in this what President Trump called this invisible war, because it's going on behind closed doors in hospitals, that the people who are on the front line are experiencing levels of stress, conflict, and mental trauma, which is the stuff of great movies and television. And there will be doctors and nurses who have the most incredible stories which will blow our minds. Television is well positioned to explore some of these stories. After 9-11, there were numerous television shows with spies and soldiers as the heroes. I'm just making sure we don't get hit again. On behalf of the President of the United States, it is my privilege to welcome you home. We had Rescue Me, where firefighters were the heroes. And I think that doctors and nurses are the new superheroes. Check out this Banksy cartoon that came out yesterday. It sums it up, really. In the bin, you've got the superheroes, the superheroes who won the war on terror. How relevant are these superheroes in a world where we're up against a microscopic virus? I don't think people are going to stop watching superhero movies just because suddenly people like me are saying they're no longer relevant. The biggest problem blockbuster superhero movies have at the moment come from the distribution problems and the production problems. Check out my film, The Blockbuster is Dead. One superhero movie that just from the trailer looks incredibly relevant and now is Wonder Woman 1984. The world needs you. Nothing good is born from lies. Wonder Woman's defining weapon is her lasso and the fact she's got a bullshit detector. And right now, this is something that all of us could use. Who are you? We're a small group of reactionary terrorists. When politicians and generals and other people lie, this is the time to pick up your camera if you're a documentary filmmaker. After 9-11, there was a massive spike in documentaries. Members of Congress, this is Michael Moore. How could Congress pass this Patriot Act without even reading it? Sit down, my son. Uh, we don't read most of the bills. No one read it. That movie was the biggest grossing documentary of all time. It did over 100 million, a documentary. And then there are the brilliant war documentaries. Taxi to the Dark Side, No End in Sight. There will be movies after the pandemic, documentaries favorable about how various people handle things. But the real meat is the documentary filmmakers who blow off the doors of the lies that have been told across the board. I'm sure somebody will make a movie about Wuhan, the guy who discovers it 
turns whistleblower, is arrested, and then dies of the virus. The irony in that story is massive. I hope we'll see Laura Potras pick up a camera and interview Fauci. Laura, at this stage, I can offer nothing more than my word. I am a senior government employee in the intelligence community. I hope you understand that contacting you is extremely high risk. So I don't know anything about you. Okay. Um, my name is Edward Snowden. The one movie that will get made eventually will be the Trump and Fauci movie because it's the whole story in two characters. Movies are about people. And in Trump and Fauci, you have this battle, science versus money. That's an incredibly powerful conflict. And what makes it even more powerful is the fact that Fauci is so diplomatic and you can tell he's been struggling. Fauci told the journal Science, I can't jump in front of a microphone and push him down. Fauci's memoirs right now have got to be worth $10 million. After the pandemic, definitely somebody will make a big movie about Fauci and Trump and their relationship and how they handled this. The key to it is not for you to write it. Think about how you could take a piece of a story like Trump and Fauci and put it in a sci-fi movie or TV show. Probably one of the biggest TV shows ever made about the war on terror was Battlestar Galactica. Darryl! So it took the war on terror and gave us a step back and told the story and made it feel real and very now. I think you've got to look at what audiences wanted after 9-11. Certainly in America, Britain. Revenge. And look at 24, Jack Bauer. I mean, that TV show had Jack Bauer killing and torturing his way around LA to the extent that the CIA were watching it and they were having a meeting, a brainstorming meeting, saying, how are we going to find out about terrorist attacks? And somebody just said, well, we could go Jack Bauer on their ass. <laughs> I want the name of the person who gave the order to pull the trigger. So you've got this feedback loop where Joel Cerno is making 24, everyone's whooping, the CIA are whooping, and say, so, well, let's do it like him. And while the American administration, with the help of Britain's MI6 and MI5, was torturing suspects, that was reflected in a new wave of stories which were from the horror genre. Torture porn. Movies such as Wolf Creek, Saw, Hostel. They were beyond anything we'd seen. They were just sadistic. And I think what Eli Roth says about Hostel is interesting. The films that really strike a nerve with the public very often reflect something that everyone consciously or unconsciously feels atomic age, post 9-11, post Iraq war. I mean, you look at Saw. I mean, what is that? That's the embodiment of the war on terror, of where characters are chained up in utter horror, and then they have to torture each other or kill each other to survive. <laughs> COVID is insidious, and I think horror is a very capable genre to explore our fears from one step back. I think we could see some absolutely stonking societal horror movies in the vein of what Jordan Peele's been doing for the last couple of years. So if you write horror, see if you can skew it in to a societal horror and something that feels very now, because that could be the reason that a producer might finance it because they'll look at it and say, oh, this feels very relevant right now. And it gives everyone a reason to make it as opposed to, well, low budget horror always does well. Your horror movie can be terrifying, but it can still have a social value and a relevance. For the purge. I purge because staying in is an American. So after the pandemic, I think we're gonna see documentaries some of the best documentaries ever made. I think we're going to see some brilliant TV shows that will be based on true stories. And if you write horror, comedy, sci-fi, I think these are all going to be very rich scenes to mine after the pandemic. When society goes through great trauma and pain, often it leads to extraordinary art, films, television, paintings. Remember the scene in The Third Man. Well, what the fella said, Mentally, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Screw it, fella. Out. Out.